share my screen. Can everyone see this? I'm going to assume yes. Um, yeah, we can. <laughs> So I'm really glad that I uh, uh, suggested Jimai versus Hanjozo as a theme, because I think that Hanjozo is a really misunderstood concept, and I think that it can be challenging to explain to the guest, and um, you know, especially since Junmai means pure rice sake, and so the natural reaction is, oh well, I want to drink what's pure. I don't want to drink what's not pure. And I, you know, I was I was listening to Eric give a seminar on Japanese whiskey not too long ago, and I was. Uh, really inspired how he was talking about how more than the distiller, the blender is actually really considered the shokunin and the craftsman. And I think that there's a lot of ways that we can show Hanjozo in a more positive light and really explain to the guests the stylistic reasons that people would have for adding alcohol. Um, I think because of what we know about adding alcohol, we think we tend to think in incorrect ways about Hanjozo, right? We think for the customer might think that it's fortified. They might assume that the alcohol is being added to make a cheaper product or a, or a greater yield, which certainly can be the case for bulk sake or futsushu, but in Hanjozo, it's pretty highly regulated. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about what defines Junmai versus Hanjozo stylistically. And then as we go through tasting, I wanted to taste in pairs so we can kind of pick out what is very Junmai-like about this particular sake compared to what might be more Hanjozo-like about another sake, if that's okay. So it shouldn't take, I don't, I don't know if it will take the whole hour, and I know we got a little bit of a late start, but for me, the way that I like to um, explain Hanjozo versus Junmai, and there are a lot of people on this call who know a lot about sake, so please feel free to interrupt me or chime in with something that really works well for you. But um, so Junmai is pure rice sake, and when you add a little bit of distillate, Legally, the uh, distilled alcohol has to be added before pressing. So it's right at the end of the Maromi stage. It's added at the end because it's not added to fortify the sake. Um, and it's an interesting legal uh, amount that's able to be added. It's 10% of the weight of the rice used after polishing, um, which is a strange concept to try to grasp in terms of volume. But it's not done to raise the alcohol content. Um, Hanjozos are not necessarily higher in alcohol, they usually are not. If you look at the ABVs of the Endless Summer and the Sword of the Sun, uh, we happen to be drinking all non-genchu sakes today, so they've all been diluted with water. The reason that it's added, it's not to extend the yield and it's not to uh, fortify the sake or raise the ABV. There are certain ginjo aromas in uh, sakes made with ginjo yeast that are not water soluble. And so when you add a little bit of distilled alcohol, you tend to enhance more of these ginjo aromas. So if you're looking at the aroma wheel here, what you see in the ginjo cluster, like banana, apple, pear, melon, lychee, pineapple, cherry, strawberry, anise, bubblegum, blossom, lily, rose, you might see those notes more enhanced. And it also diminishes the perception of umami and acidity. So where junmai is very associated with umami um, and acidity, hanjozo is not. So it's, it's a lighter, brighter sake that also, the texture changes very much when it goes from Junmai to Hanjozo. I don't know if you guys have ever done a side-by-side uh, -side tasting of our two Konteki sakes, the Pearls of Simplicity and the Tears of Dawn. This is a really interesting way to, to understand what Hanjozo does texturally because those sakes are basically the same sake. They're both same same aibuai, same rice type, uh, same yeast, same length of fermentation, same water but the texture on Pearls of Simplicity has this very distinct rice minerality um, and a little bit of salinity where Tears of Dawn is very silky and very velvety. So I like to think of Hanjozo sakes as great, you know, session, sessionable sakes. They're not lower in alcohol, but you can really just keep drinking them. They don't give you palate fatigue um, and they're a little easier to understand, which is the reason that for sake competitions, any alcohol added sakes, any non junmais are, are judged in a separate category because most people feel like it's not fair to put a daiginjo next to a jumai daiginjo, because the daiginjo with alcohol added is going to be so much more opulent and vibrant and, and gorgeous on the nose, where the junmai daiginjo, you have to get to know it a little longer. It has to sit in the glass. And so um, 
you know, it's a very different preference. I think that some people, some Junmai purists might say that non-Junmai is too obvious, too in your face. But I think that when we're trying to get people excited about sake and we want them to be impressed on the first sip, an alcohol added sake can be a great choice. Um, so we can go ahead and jump in with the first pairing. I think we have the uh, Amanoto and the Sword of the Sun. So if we want to just kind of take a not quite full on W set approach to breaking this one down, but you know, if we're thinking this is a Jumai sake, Jumai sake generally has more of these cereal grain notes, right? Amanoto happens to be a producer that is all about the rice. Sorry, my slides are a little out of order. Um, Amanoto is the first true grower producer in Japan in the sense that the rice farmers are the people who make the sake. They started out in the business as rice farmers, very different trade from brewing. Um, they, but they were so passionate about growing sake rice and Akita is such a famous part of Japan for sake rice that they eventually started brewing their own sake and uh, very legendary brewery in Japan. The, uh, the Toji uh, Moriya-san was very, it was relatively famous in the sake world and um, they had just recently celebrated their 100 year anniversary and unfortunately last year uh, the Toji passed away of her pulmonary embolism but he passed away, he collapsed in his own rice field which is such a kind of beautiful poetic thing. So when I taste Amanoto, I always kind of find these, no matter what sake it is from Amanoto, and they only make Junmai, they would never make Hanjozo or Futsushu, it's, it's very much about their core philosophy. So I think it's a good sake to start this kind of discussion about. So on the nose, I'm not really getting these Ginjo aromas. I think the, like to the, the cluster to the right of the Ginjo cluster, the fruit and floral, I think we're de it definitely is quite floral, but it's not that blossom lily rose, it's more white flowers. Uh, quite a bit of cereal and grain on the nose, uh, steamed rice, a little bit of porridge. I tend to get white chocolate on the nose of this sake uh, and, and a lot of nuts, you know, some of that almond, marzipan, hazelnut. And on the palate, this is very Junmai to me. You know, you really have the graininess of the rice on the palate, uh, a little bit of salinity. Uh, I think the there's more of a nut skin quality on the palate uh, where there's a, not, you know, not quite a tannin, but there's almost this grip coming from that like almond skin quality. So in terms of what makes the sake junmai, we have nice acidity, very grain driven, very, very steamed rice porridge aromas and not so, not so enhanced ginjo aromas. So for the Hanjozo that we'll try side by side, we're going to try the Takatenjin, the Sword of the Sun. I have it right here. And just to talk about Takatenjin a little bit. So Takatenjin is from Shizuoka. Uh, most people know Shizuoka because they know about Mount Fuji. And um, this area of Shizuoka, Kakegawa, is reportedly the sunniest part of Japan year round. They, are able to get all of their um, energy from solar panels, which is why we call it Sword of the Sun. And when we started working with the producer of Takatenjin, they really wanted to show us their very beautiful, pristine, showy sakes. You guys have probably had um, Soul of the Sensei at one point or another. It's really bright and vibrant. And we visited the brewery once and we tasted Sword of the Sun. And the president kind of chuckled when we said we wanted to bring it in because he said, well, this is kind of, this is not, a sake that I would ever think about exporting. It's what my employees drink, you know, during the brewing season. And if you think about it, you know, when you're living in a brewery for six months, you're spending a lot of time together and it's not all brewing and you're drinking a lot of sake. And he always wanted it to be, you know, this was a favorite amongst the brewers. And it also, even though this is Tokubetsu Honjozo, it's milled to 60%. And it does have some ginjo aromas. He never wanted to call it a ginjo because he wanted it, he felt like it was a humble sake and he didn't want his employees to feel like they weren't supposed to be drinking it. He didn't want someone to feel like they couldn't open a bottle by themselves on a Monday night. It's not a special occasion sake. Um, a couple other interesting things about Kakegawa and Chizuoka, it, uh, this is where most of the wasabi fields are in Japan and it's very famous for green tea. Uh, wasabi and green tea can both get very expensive and wasabi root Grows, uh, grows underwater and it can only grow in very pristine water, which really speaks to that purity of the water 
with Takatenjin. And as you guys know, sake is 80% water and we add water at every single stage of production. So um, I think the water really comes through. And this is, this middle picture is just very cute. It's uh, Doisan, the president has a very charming family. Um, so we'll go back to the aroma wheel as we're tasting this one. So we know that alcohol has been added. So we're probably expecting something that's less grain driven, less ricey, and maybe has more ginjo aroma. I get, uh, I definitely get some pear and melon on the nose of the sake. I don't get rice. Um, I do get some of these uh, herbs and spice notes, like maybe some grass, a little bit of mint. I always think this is a good gin drinker sake because I do find some of these, not, not quite juniper, but these botanical notes that I associate with gin. Uh, a very green, also cucumber. So cucumber, pear, apple. And on the palate, this is very different from the Amanoto, right? We're not getting that graininess. It's lighter, it's brighter. You know, it's, it's a, I would definitely describe this as more lifted on the finish than the Amanoto. So we're going to taste this side by the same sake side by side with the Tozai Living Jewel. This one was actually pretty challenging for me to think of, or I was a little intimidated to do this in the side by side tasting because Living Jewel is probably the least Junmai like sake that we have. Um, but it still passes the test. So let's see. Um, so Tozai is from Kyoto, which is known as the birthplace of sake. You know, I feel, we feel very proud that we were able to find this kind of fine balance and finding a brand that people can connect with and is, is approachable to a more broad a US audience, but is still very uh, authentic and has a lot of, of quality behind it. So this is a family owned brewery. Tozai means East meets West. Um, you know, there are a lot of sakes out there where it's just kind of a name that sounds Asian and it's easy to pronounce, but it doesn't really mean anything. And Tozai, I think, really, um, really encompasses what we're trying to do with this brand and make sake a little more accessible and um, something that's more of an everyday drink. The koi fish has a couple of reasons behind it. Every generation of this family that owns this brewery is, is a competitive swimmer. But also koi fish are such an important creature in Japan. They can live longer than any other species. They can live to over 200 years old. And uh, so a very powerful image. And then to, so on the right, on the left-hand side of the label, we have a different origami pattern for each of our Tozai uh, labels. So we wanted to have something that was eye-catching, but didn't feel like we were um, selling our souls. And, you know, being a more approachable Jumai, we're not going to find as much umami and richness with this sake, I would say. I would say that there's definitely a rice flour and steamed rice quality on the nose. And there is fruit. Um, I do think that there's banana. It's not quite ginjo banana though. It's not that like really banana candy. It's, it's a ripe banana. And I find more of the fruit and floral in the non-ginjo fruit and floral. Like I do think that there's grape, lemon. And for me, the rice quality is very different on the finish here. There's more of that marshmallowy rice, like steamed rice, soft fluffiness on the palate. If you go back to Sword of the Sun, there's a silkiness on the palate that to me indicates the added alcohol, where the Living Jewel has more of that soft, fluffy mid palate that's more of that ricey marshmallow. Um, I happen to, I mean, I, it really depends on the occasion. I think that having a very delicate Junmai is a great by the glass choice. It's a great, you know, lunch sake to be able to offer a 300 milliliter. I think that if people are really wanting to have a coarse meal with, and you're picking out a Junmai, you might want to pick something more like Amanoto that has more umami and more acidity. This is a pretty low, this is probably the lowest umami Junmai, kind of more in like a Niigata style jumai sake to me, but it does have these distinct rice, rice driven characteristics to it. 
So let's see, the next flight we're doing is Kawatsuru and Endless Summer. So Kawatsuru is a newer producer at our portfolio and one that I'm really excited about. So Kawatsuru is uh, on the island of Shikoku in Kagawa Prefecture. Shikoku is uh, supposed to be the most laid back island in Japan and it's really beautiful. Um, they, a lot of, when you hear the word Sanuki, like Sanuki Udon, that kind of refers to this like Kagawa and Shikoku culture. Uh, their Udon is amazing. I put this uh, Zenikata sand shrine in the right hand corner, uh, upper right hand corner here, because I thought it was especially apt right now. Japanese people can be very superstitious. And um, this is, this sand shrine was built and the legend, the legend is that anyone who looks at it will live a long and healthy life with no financial burdens. So I figure even if we're looking at this virtually, maybe it can help us all out right now. And um, so Kawatsuru, it's all estate grown rice. So the, the, this jumai that we're having, the Crane of Paradise, it's made with 100% uh, estate grown Yamada Nishiki. And you can see the president Kawaito-san here looking at his Yamada Nishiki fields. And the um, Kawatsuru means river crane, but there's a lot of auspicious things about this area, not just the sand shrine that's gonna keep you financially sound and healthy. And this particular river is supposed to bring you a lot more longevity and prosperity as well. So I think we could all use some of that right now. Um, so going back to the aroma and flavor wheel, this is an interesting sake because it's, so the style is umakuchi and umakuchi, you know, there's karakuchi, which is dry, amakuchi, which is sweet. And then umakuchi is kind of a little more umami or kind of balanced between the two. And I think this distinctly has very ginjo notes, but also very umami notes. Like I, I get so much pineapple and so much anise seed on the nose here. But I also get a very, uh, very savory quality. You know, a little bit of soy sauce, almost a dashi, like, Maritime umami is smoky, walking on the reef at low tide, kind of smoky umami. And on the palate, I think it's really juicy. So Kagawa's characteristics of Yamada Nishiki, you know, that's a good question. Uh, the grains are, the grains are really well defined. I mean, I've seen the Yamada Nishiki grains compared to like Hyogon Yamada Nishiki and they're there are large grains with good starch content, but there's a lot less clay in the soil in uh, Kagawa than there is in Kyogo. So I think it's not as, um, it, it doesn't have the ability to polish as far, but it does have really, in the se same sense of well-made Yamada Nishiki, it has that soft, generous texture um, and can work really well with more modern Ginjo yeasts. And so like this one, I'm, this is a, he says it's a local yeast, but I'm pretty sure this is very similar to 1801. You know, I think that like ethyl, that eth caproic acid, the ethyl caparate really stands out to me with the anise seed and the pineapple. But, um, but I would say that the koji making is probably a little more, uh, a little more sohaze because we, these are very clearly koji aromas to me on the nose. And the palate is very juicy. Um, I think that it's the juiciest junmai I've ever had. You know, a lot of people drink junmai and they expect something very rustic, very uh, savory on the palate. I think the savory is more on the nose than on the palate here for me. And um, it's kind of, there is a smokiness that I really like. I find that mezcal drinkers tend to gravitate towards a sake like this that has that tropical fruit, but still really nice smoke. So we're gonna taste this side by side with the Tensei Endless Summer. And this is a, both of these sakes are quite powerful, I think compared to the first Jumai and Hamjozo pairings that we've had. Endless Summer is powerful to me because of how, how much salinity is in the water. So Tensei is from Kanagawa Prefecture. Uh, Kanagawa is where the great wave of Kanagawa made it famous. It's known as the Shonan region of Japan, kind of the surfer region of Japan very amazing place. And for so long, you know, the idea about sake, where sake should be brewed is that it should be brewed in a very cold area with very soft water. And so this beachy area of Japan with a lot of minerality in the water was not really thought of as a great place to make sake. But these, the people behind Tensei really 
really thought that they could celebrate having the minerality in the water and make a mineral driven, very saline, uh, salty style of sake. And this producer uh, in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the Toji's picture, Igarashi san. He is, uh, he is kind of a genius in fermentation and he, he started his brewing career working at Ju Yondai, which I know you guys know about because you guys probably sell more Ju Yondai in Vegas than anywhere else in the country. Um, so a very cult, iconic brewery that really, really changed the way people thought about sake. You know, all of a sudden, sake became a collector's item and sake became something where the price would, would go through the roof. And so he was part of that movement and um, he is also the beer brewer and the sake brewer for, uh, they make a beer called Shonan Beer. So they make beer, sake, and they make pizza, um, which is why I have this pizza in the top right-hand corner. This is from, they have a trattoria on property, and they really love to do a lot of interesting uh, yeast isolation and lab experimenting with blending beer yeast into their, their pizza dough, blending so beer yeast into their sake yeast, sake yeast into their beer yeast, and back and forth. And so I think there is this really interesting yeastiness to the sake that um, that really bring makes me feel like I'm at the ocean. And uh, so I think the Endless Summer name kind of makes a lot of sense here. So going to the aroma wheel as, as we're tasting now. And yes, Ayasan's been to the brewery and it really is such a good pizza. You know, I, don't, I was watching David Chang's Ugly Delicious uh, episode on pizza and he was trying to say that the two best places in the world for pizza are New Haven, Connecticut and Tokyo, which, I think he likes to piss people off sometimes, but um, but it really is a thing. I mean, like I, the more I, a lot of people contact me when they're going to Japan, and pretty much everyone who reaches out to me lately about going to Tokyo, they want to go to Savoy, you know, they want to go to PST, and these pizza Japanese culture, I feel like, is all about taking something from another culture and obsessing over it until it's perfect, which is why. We have Japanese whiskey, which they got from Scotland, and it's why we have Japanese denim that you know if you put on Japanese denim, you'll never go back to Levi's. But anyhow, let's taste the Tensei. So on the nose, I really get a lot of apple, like very candy, I like Jolly Jolly Rancher green apple note. Um, apple, melon, pear, not quite into that really tropical fruit. I don't really get any lychee, pineapple, but definitely apple. Um, and I think the saltiness and the yeastiness is even there on the nose. It has a little bit of a saltwater taffy or even like fortune cookie note on the nose. And the finish is very salty, right? It's that sea salt kind of marine salt. But, you know, we didn't get any rice notes on the sake, not on the nose or on the palate. We're not getting any steamed rice or porridge. We're not, we are getting salinity, but the salinity is clearly coming from the minerality in the water instead of from the dissolved rice minerality. So this is a very, I think, refreshing style of Hanjozo. If you go back, if you have some sort of the sun left and you go back and taste it, sort of the sun is much more delicate to me texturally, but, and I think you can really feel the, the effect of the added alcohol on that kind of silky, viscous texture on the palate. But, uh, the Endless Summer, to me, if I blind tasted this, I would not think it was Junmai. I think it's a little more linear. It doesn't evolve as much in the glass. You know, the thing, I really think it's fun to decant Junmais that take a while to express themselves in the glass because air does affect a Junmai, where if you decant a Hanjozo, it's kind of, I mean, you get what you get right right when you pour it in the glass. And so it's, it's a lot more... Um, it's more one dimensional than Junmai, but that's not a bad thing. You know, I think if you are looking for like a porch pounder kind of style of sake or a lunch sake, Hanjozo is a really great place to be. Uh, yeah, I decant Kimoto and Yamaha, especially aged sakes. I also find that if there's a slight flaw in a sake and I decant it, sometimes it goes away. Like certain, uh, like a little bit of a hine in a sake, if I if it gets enough air, it seems to calm down. Or if there's like a, uh, like a, what, a rubber smell, like um, a little bit on the nose, in a decanter, it seems to calm down. So if you really have a problematic sake and you're not sure um, if you want to serve it to a guest, I would try decanting it first and see if it improves before you decide to throw it away. Or if you're drinking at home and, I mean, you're not thrilled about it. Um, 
Okay, so next we are going to do Hawk in the Heavens with the uh, Endless Summer. So Hawk in the Heavens to me is, I'm so glad you guys sell a lot of this in, um, in Vegas because it's like one of the most underrated sakes in our portfolio, I think. It's, it's so unique um, and it's so, so beautifully Junmai. So Tentaka is uh, from Tochigi. Tochigi is becoming more and more on the map, I think, with, uh, be a, as a sake producing region. There are some really great producers from, from Tochigi. There's Senki and there's Daina. Um, Tentaka is very known for making Junmai style sakes that aren't ostentatious and they're not high tone. Um, even their most luxurious Junmai Daiginjos are actually quite uh, restrained compared to a lot of Ginjo Roma. And um, they, they're very obsessive about their investment in organic. They're one of only two breweries in Japan that have triple organic certification from the USDA, European Union, and the Japanese EcoCert. Um, so they, it's, it's a really exhaustive process to get that triple certification, but in order to do it, um, all, bye Eric, talk to you later. Um, all their rice that they grow, and they grow all their own rice, had to be grown organically. And, um, and so it's, it is a very environmentally friendly, thoughtfully made sake. And if we go to the aroma wheel, so on the nose, this is definitely Junmai, right? There's so much shiitake mushroom, chocolate. I, I always get like a pistachio ice cream note on the nose. You know, I think that Junmai to me usually has some kind of a dairy element. And this has the most dairy to me out of all the, all the sake. It's pistachio, yeah, melted pistachio ice cream, mushroom, cocoa, sesame oil. Definitely not ginjo aromas, right? If there is banana here, it's very baked banana, banana bread. This is the highest acid sake that we've tasted, and I think you can really feel the acidity on the palate. Um, the umami, I always like think of this as like vegan umami. You know, there's no meat or dashi really, like. It's very pure mushroom and nuts and chocolate. And so I think this is a really approachable umami. If people are intimidated by funk in sake, this has, this has everything that you want from that savory, earthy sake without making people feel, you know, sometimes people aren't ready for an intense meat or uh, fish quality in their sake. So this is a really nice, like, it's all the umami with none of the animals involved. And so I think on the, you know, I think there are, looking at the cereal and grain cluster, there is definitely toasted cereal, malt. Uh, I think someone who likes, who likes a malty beer, this is an easy sake to introduce to them. Um, and on the palate, we do get, it's lingering. It's not as, you know, if you compare it to the endless summer, the finish is shorter. The body feels much lighter on endless summer. This has more the hawk in the heavens, more persistent, more lingering, more of that rice texture. So um, just to recap, or maybe like talk a little bit more about, about Junmai versus Hanjozo. Um, I think you guys know, but the alcohol that's added for Honjozo, it's almost always a sugarcane distillate. Um, often it is imported from Brazil. Uh, there's so much, Brazil and Japan are very friendly, as you know, there's so many Brazilian, half Japanese, half Brazilian people, and there's a lot of trade back and forth. And so uh, sugarcane and, and sushi samba, of course. <laughs> um, so the sugarcane distillate was found to be a very neutral and cost-effective spirit. And so Almost all sake that uses distilled alcohol uses sugarcane. There are a couple of breweries that use rice shochu. Um, the only one that I can think of right now is Kimbishi. But um, it, sugarcane distilled is found to be a really great, a great choice for making hanjozo. And um, it's interesting, you know, the decision to not put it on the label, like if it's Ginjo and not Jumai Ginjo, you know alcohol is added. And if it's Dai Ginjo and not Jumai Dai Ginjo, you know alcohol is added. 
I think that honestly has also contributed to people thinking that there, there's something to hide if you're adding alcohol. But it really is a stylistic decision. And the reason that Hondoza wasn't added was because you were, the taxation, the rate of taxation was different for Jumai versus Hanjozo. So removing the Hanjozo from the label improved the amount of taxation. So it's really a purely economical decision. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I wanted to talk to you guys today about with Jumai and Hanjozo. Aya, do you have anything uh, that you wanna add from personal experience or any takeaways from tasting? Yeah, I, I think so. Like, I think, you know, people don't, like, we think, always think about Jumai and like, don't think about Honjozo as much. But I, I think in over the years and drinking a lot of sake, and I think it's nice to have uh, the lightness and the, like what you explain, it's just a very different style. So I think Honjozo should have, you know, space in your list, I think. And it's, it's like, like you said, and it's a great patio kind of, you know, <laughs> drink. And then yeah, I just ask, and like, so like, if you like, Lido came up with the Jumai grass, right? Like a bigger bowl. And then if you don't have the, like those grass, I think it's great for like Tentaka or something like that. But it, would you use bigger grass, like a burgundy grass for Jumai? I like, I like a bigger glass. You know, yeah. I think that some people say that because Jumai is so rustic, you should have it out of like yakimono and ceramics um, mm -hmm. in a small cup. But I think that, you know, tasting something like the kawatsuru or the hawk in the heavens, they're yeah. so layered. And mm -hmm. I think it's kind of, you miss a lot of it if you're tasting it in a small cup. Yeah, I feel like that. Like, you know, even today, like you're drinking like some wine grass and like, yeah, like this is, should be like with the bigger grass. And then like now, like side by side, especially like, oh, wow, this is much bigger. Yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't talk much about uh, the food pairing, but would you suggest food, food pairing for oh, like? Yes. So kawatsuru for me is really great with uh, like a spicy sausage, um, like any kind of sausage, actually. I was having it with the uh, finokiona the other day and the fennel and the finokiona and the kawatsuru uh, was really great together. But I was, I was thinking about the... Uh, like the every time I go to Momofuku Sambar in New York, I get the rice cakes with the sausage, and I've had that with the kawatsuru, and it's phenomenal. And um, the hawk in the heavens, I really like to have with um, well, it's really good with any kind of like tare, uh, like teriyaki sauce, but it's also a really interesting, more Western pairing with like a brown butter potato puree or brown butter cauliflower puree. I think the you know that creamy uh like ice cream note it's it's really luxurious when you pair it with something that has a good amount of fat um but it's it's very very good with any kind of teriyaki or even barbecue sauce the endless summer the saltiness here i think goes really well with gruyere gruyere cheese uh goat cheese i really i think any flavors of the ocean something really briny like uni uh ikura oysters is amazing pairing the amanoto um i find that it's really really good with japanese pickles the um the toji was also a really well uh well regarded chef and he would make the best uh nukazuke or the pickles with the sake kasu and it was kind of this local like people would would come and buy the nukazuke and, and buy a bottle of amanoto and enjoy it and i had it at the brewery and there was something especially i think like carrots um pickled carrots with the sake is so amazing the Takatenji in the Sword of the Sun, um, I like it with lighter, fresher flavors, like a scallop ceviche with kind of a slightly sweet component, um, a you know melon salad with mint, uh, prosciutto and melon. The Living Jewel is a really amazing tofu pairing. Um, there's something that's really soft and, and generous about it. So even like chawamushi, it's really good with the sake. Chawamushi is great with amanoto as well. Um, but I think there's a lot of directions that we can go in with these. Yeah, another well, question. Nate likes amanoto with kimchi, which I bet is great. Uh, I would like a kind of a sweet and tangy kimchi. I bet would be good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, we have to do that. But Nate, when you guys open it up back. Um, next question for me is, uh, what do you think of the temperature, the serving temperature for Jinmai versus Honjozo? 
So I think in general, June Mai can be a little warmer, right? A little more room temperature. And uh, June Mai is one where if I'm doing staff trainings, I'm like, you know, I, I know that in Vegas, people are kind of set in their ways a lot of times. And if people want ice cold sake, that's what they want. But yeah, uh, June Mai is the one like where, warm, you know, season people would say like probably like this is not warm and uh, cold enough, and exactly. then they get chilled. I would just, just say to service staff like don't assume that they want an ice bucket if they're getting June Mai. Ask them if they want to leave it on the table. Maybe explain what happens if it if it stays on the table. Like you know, the acidity becomes a little rounder, the rustic aromatics become a little more pronounced. You know, it becomes slightly more savory, and then see if they want if they're interested in that and. Um, and then if it is a uh, hanjozo, I would say it should be chilled. Um, and the kawatsuru, I think, probably should be chilled. But for the amanoto and the, the tentaka, I think that those are so beautiful at room temperature. Yeah, I agree. Like, yeah, like people automatically think this is going to be super chill for Jinmai. But I think I like the, like, sometimes, you know, you know, put on the table, like, same as wine, you know, the gradual temperature change. And then I think you can see that really well. And yeah, especially those two sake, it's gonna be beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any question from everyone? Yeah, I think Amanoto with the kimchi would be amazing. <laughs> I, I have to try it. Yeah. Um, well, Aya, thank you so much for delivering these samples to everyone. It's really nice to be able to all taste from the same bottle in the same tasting conditions. Like I'm sure mm -hmm. you, had some virtual tasting groups in a lot of different scenarios during this quarantine thing. And it's kind of hard when you're listening to someone say something you totally disagree with and you're like, well, maybe we just have different bottles or we have right. like, yeah. And so mm -hmm. this is a really nice way to ensure a little more consistency across the board. And um, yeah, I'm really, thank you guys all for making time for this. And I really, every day I hope a little more intensely that we can get back to normal soon. But if there's yeah. anything that I can do for you guys, or if there's any materials that you'd like me to prepare for your staff or um, any changes that you want to discuss as you're getting ready for new conditions with reopening, um, let me know. And yeah, I, I'm jealous of you guys and your lucky dog box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, if you want to do a little bit of, uh, you know, training,